Artificial intelligence will likely dramatically impact your life in the coming years, but do you know what exactly it is and the major implications surrounding its development? Well, most people don't. So in this video, we're going to be covering the philosophy of artificial intelligence, the branch of philosophy that explores what artificial intelligence specifically is and other philosophical questions surrounding it, like can a machine act intelligently? Is the human brain essentially a computer? Can a machine be alive like a human is? Can it have a mind and consciousness? Can we build AI and align it with our values and ethics? If so, what ethical systems do we choose? We're going to be covering all those questions and possible answers to them in what will hopefully be an easy to understand 101 style manner. So what is artificial intelligence exactly? To answer that question, we need to understand what intelligence is first, and if something artificial or a machine can have it. The term artificial intelligence was coined and the field of study officially launched in 1956 during a DARPA sponsored event at Dartmouth College. However, prior to this important event, many individuals were already thinking about artificial intelligence related questions, including the idea that machines could or couldn't be intelligent. One of the first thinkers to write about whether machines could display human level intelligence in the first place was Rene Descartes considered by some to be the father of modern philosophy. Basically, he believed machines or automata could never replicate human intelligence. Writing different automata or moving machines could be made by the industry of man, for we can easily understand a machine's being constituted so that it can utter words and even emit some responses to action on it of a corporal kind, which brings about a change in its organs. For instance, if touched in a particular part, it may ask what we wish to say to it. If in another part, it may exclaim that it's being hurt and so on, but it never happens that it arranges its speech in various ways in order to reply appropriately to everything that may be said in its presence as even the lowest type of man could do. Okay, so was he right all along? Can a machine never exhibit real intelligence? Well, first, we have to define intelligence, something philosophers and linguists have struggled to do. Alan Turing, dubbed the father of computer science, wondered if a machine could overcome this deficiency of language and the supposed lack of intelligence Descartes described. In a famous 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, he believes we should switch out the question, can machines think, with the question, can a machine be linguistically indistinguishable from a human to help answer the intelligence question? He thought intelligence is hard to define, but we know it when we see it. It's manifested in our speech. And when we talk to another person, we have a polite convention that they're intelligent. So why not do that with a machine? A computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could deceive a human into believing it was human, he wrote. And then he goes on to devise what's known as the Turing test, a way to prove a machine has human level intelligence. The standard interpretation of the test goes as follows. A woman and a computer are in different rooms, and a human judge must figure out which room contains the machine and which the woman. And he asks questions both via email, or in that day, uh, it's called teletype. And if you can do no better than 50-50 when delivering the verdict as to which room the computer was in, that computer has passed the Turing test. It could also be said to have human-level intelligence. However, there's been some criticisms of this way of defining an intelligent machine, including that the test isn't measuring intelligence, more of the humanness of the machine in question. Human behavior and intelligent behavior are not exactly the same thing after all. So back to the first question, what is artificial intelligence? Well, there's no consensus definition still to this day. However, in one of the most comprehensive works on AI, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, author Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig have grouped all possible answers to this question into a simple chart, where they assume AI is defined in terms of its goals. The goals of AI are centered around two questions. So we judge AI based on its similarities to humans, for example, like Turing, or an ideal rational being. And should we judge AI based on its ability to think or its ability to act? The definition of AI would be AI is the field that aims at building, and then you insert your preferred position. So what would uh, Turing, Turing think? Well, Turing would be AI is the field that aims at building systems that act like humans. What do Stuart and Norvig believe? Well, when we think of intelligence, we think not of human behavior necessarily, but of rationality. Aeronautical engineering texts they wrote do not define the goal of their field as making machines that fly so exactly like pigeons so that they can fool other pigeons. They see AI as the field of study that aims at building systems that act rationally, specifically what they call intelligent agents. Now that would put them in the systems that act rationally camp. Now what's an intelligent agent? They explain that right at the beginning of the textbook. The main unifying theme 
is the idea of an intelligent agent. We can define AI as the study of agents that receive precepts or perceptions from the environment and perform actions. Each such agent implements a function that maps precept sequences to actions, and we cover different ways to represent these functions. And then they give this example of what they mean by an intelligent agent. Now in the book, they outline how these agents can become increasingly complex. So we have a simple looking reflex agent here, uh, but this can become more complex to something like where the agent is now self-learning. But one could argue that something like a thermostat could potentially count as a rational agent and thus uh, is AI. But we don't think of things like thermostats as AI, really. Now, there's one definition outlined by one of the founding fathers of AI, Alan Newall, given at the original Dartmouth conference, which encapsulates all of Russell and Norbrook's possibilities, which is AI is the field devoted to building artifacts that are intelligent, where intelligent is operationalized through intelligence tests, such as the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, and other tests of mental ability, including tests of mechanical ability, creativity, and so on. So we might not ever achieve a full consensus of what AI is, but this definition might be satisfactory for now. Okay, since we understand AI by the goals of the field, there are some important ways of categorizing it to help further understand what it is. Now, there's two dichotomies we need to go over, which are weak AI versus strong AI and narrow artificial intelligence versus general artificial intelligence. The philosopher John Searle has proposed two goals of AI development to help us further understand and explore what it is. And these are weak AI and strong AI. First, weak AI are informational processing machines that appear to have all the mental capacities of living humans or animals, but are not alive. So they don't have conscious experience. However, a weak AI system can pass the Turing test or the total Turing test. This is a concept where a machine passes for a human in all aspects, such as throwing a ball and being creative. Strong AI is artificial persons or creatures that are alive, meaning they have all the mental capacities, including self-awareness and consciousness. And to help distinguish between the two serial rights, according to strong AI, the correct simulation really is a mind. According to weak AI, the correct simulation is a model of the mind. And he created these terms to help formulate an argument in which artificial intelligence executing a program can never have a mind and be conscious. Um, and I'm going to be covering the argument more in depth uh, and exactly what it means in just a minute. But first note that these terms are not to be confused with narrow AI and AGI. So let's cover those real quick. Now, when we say narrow AI, we mean the process of making a computer system that can do specific tasks or things that normally require human intelligence such as understanding natural language and recognizing objects. The program can't do everything uh, human intelligence can do, uh, just a specific aspect of human intelligence. For examples of uh, narrow AI are image recognition and facial recognition systems, uh, chatbots and conversational assistants, self-driving vehicles. On the other hand, AGI is a program or a machine that can understand and learn any intellectual task that a human being can. And the performance of these uh, systems is indistinguishable from that of a human. The broad intellectual capacities of AGI would exceed human capacities because of its ability to access and process huge data sets at incredible speeds. So AGI sets out to understand systems and perform them better than humans can, while uh, narrow AI concerns itself with specific tasks or problems. Then there's something called superintelligence. Uh, this could be a goal of uh, AGI or a combination of several AGI. And philosopher Nick Bostrom defines superintelligence as any intellect that greatly exceeds the cognitive performance of all humans in virtually all domains of interest. And Bostrom treats superintelligence as general dominance at all goal-oriented behavior, becoming far superior in any activity than a human can do. Again, an AGI application can rise to a superintelligence level or several AGI can combine to form superintelligence. And sometimes you may hear strong AI used interchangeably with AGI and uh, NAI used interchangeably with weak AI, and this is not exactly correct. It's theoretically possible to have AGI, but it doesn't classify as Searle's strong AI. Okay, so we have a general understanding of what AI is at this point. So can a machine really display uh, human-like intelligence? Um, perhaps more importantly, can a machine be alive and strong AI fully realized? So Descartes said that it's not possible. But I think most philosophers would disagree with him at this point, at least when it comes to weak AI. Now, today, there doesn't seem to be any grounds to think that weak AI isn't a philosophically sound idea. It might be achieved in the next few years. If you think about it, the nervous system obeys the laws of nature as we currently understand them. So if you can replicate the brain in the nervous system, there's no reason to think 
the artificial replicant won't produce the same behavior as the natural mind. Now, in the philosophy of mind, there's uh, an idea that helps explain this called computationalism, AI research and philosophy is drawing from. Computationalism states that the mind is a computational system that is physically implemented by neural activity in the brain. Cognition and consciousness are a form of computationalism, and the mind arises from computation in the brain. Now, this theory was proposed by Hilary Putnam and Jerry Fodor in the 60s. And it can be elaborated on based on how the term computation is understood and developed. And indeed, uh, to build AI, including AlphaGo Zero, IBM's Watson, and others, engineers are drawing directly on how the human brain works. So I'm going to briefly go over some uh, main approaches to building AI so you can understand how AI machines can and almost certainly will display general human-like intelligence. And then we're going to try to answer the question of whether these machines can be alive and conscious. So AI engineers use logic-based approaches, probabilistic Bayesian approaches, neurocomputational techniques, and uh, others to build AI. And by logic, I mean logic programming. And this is uh, a programming paradigm based on formal logic. And here, program statements express facts and rules about problems within a, a system of formal logic. For example, we can see something like A is true if B1, B2, and B3 are true. And these are used to help build machines that can reason. However, there's many problems AI encounters, and we find in real life ourselves that require us to make decisions and actions based on incomplete information. So to build more sophisticated AI systems, engineers turn to probability theory, specifically Bayesian interpretation of probability from the English statistician and minister Thomas Bayes. Here are things like Bayesian networks are used, which you know, simply put are ideal for predicting things like the likelihood that one of several possible causes mainly contributed to an event that took place. Also, neurocomputational techniques, which are based on how our brains operate, are being are used to build AI. Now, one such process involve, involves uh, creating artificial neural networks based on biological neural networks in human brains. Artificial neural networks, or ANNs, consist of a collection of nodes or artificial neurons, all of which have a numeric weight and transmit information by links designed to represent the dendrites of a human brain, it's possible to train neural networks to compute information or design neural network systems with the ability to learn and improve automatically with no additional programming. So ANNs have contributed to the development of machine learning. This is an essential part of the development of AI, which helps machines make predictions or decisions without being programmed to do so. So machine learning algorithms, uh, they're typically given some sample data or training data and then self-learn, carrying out increasingly complicated tasks. Now, ANNs have also... Uh, advance the field of deep learning in AI. And by deep learning, we mean a machine having the ability to use multiple layers in the ANN to extract higher level features from raw data input progressively. So for example, a machine may identify uh, high layer concepts like animals or faces from a lower layer data like edges of an object. And of course, there's you know far more that goes into building AI and machines uh, still from just this alone it's pretty clear machines can emulate human level intelligence and actions hardly any philosophers would argue against weak ai being a philosophically sound concept at this point but there still seems to be some hang up around strong ai specifically around the idea of a machine being conscious so yes perhaps machines can be creative like humans have a degree of self-awareness uh, even be programmed to have emotional states. But can they really be awake on the inside to experience all this like humans are assumed to be? Now, in the philosophy of mind, there's no way to empirically prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that other people have consciousness. But because true propositional knowledge is thought to exist as a degree of probability, if it does exist, you know, we believe and live our lives as though other people are awake on the inside, just like we are. You know, it's more likely that I have consciousness, the guy that you're watching in this video, than I don't. So several arguments have been put forth regarding why strong AI is philosophically impossible, with most of them being you know, pretty clearly refuted. But let's go over what I think is the strongest one. It's called The Chinese Room from John Cyril, who uh, we mentioned a few minutes ago. And I'll also go over how it ties into this general hard problem of consciousness. But first, uh, the Chinese room goes like this. Uh, uh, Cyril himself is inside a room, while Chinese speakers who don't know about Cyril's presence are outside the room. Cyril knows nothing about Chinese. Chinese speakers from the outside send cards into the room via a slot with questions written in Chinese on them. There's a box next to Cyril that returns cards to the speakers. Cyril consults a rule book 
which is a table that tells him what to write in Chinese based on what actions are sent in, what questions are sent in. Now, Cyril has no idea about Chinese, but continues to return outputs that satisfy the Chinese fluent speakers outside. And Cyril paints this picture to suggest that uh, this is how strong AI would operate. It, like Cyril, would never truly understand anything and never be more than a machine, yet deliver actions and responses that suggest that it would. In recent updates to his strong AI thesis, he now seems to identify a strong a his strong AI argument as an argument more against a consciousness arising from computationalism and functionalism than a machine ever being conscious. Now, Cyril isn't arguing machines can't one day have consciousness. You know, he believes our brain is a type of machine. But it's just there's a, something non-computational about a natural human brain that gives rise to consciousness that Cyril's non-biological strong AI doesn't. Now, Cyril suggests there's something special about natural biology and human brains that generate consciousness. He writes computational models of consciousness are not sufficient by themselves for consciousness. The computational model for consciousness stands to consciousness in the same way the computational model of anything stands to the domain being modeled. Nobody supposes that the computational model of rainstorms in London will leave us all wet, but they make the mistake of supposing that the computational model of consciousness is somehow conscious. It is the same mistake in both cases. So if neuroscience is able to isolate the mechanical process that gives rise to consciousness, then Cyril grants that strong AI can exist. Now, there's a number of responses to this argument on why it's flawed, including one by Rappaport that says that while AI systems are syntactic, there's no reason why the right syntax can't constitute semantics or actual meaning. Also, philosophers have been critical about what Cyril thinks is special about uh, biological-based brains that give rise to consciousness. Uh, also, a lot of the critical responses maintain that CRA is more of a story these days about AI that's far removed from the increasingly sophisticated practice and development of AI. So there's this idea, again, that if one can replicate the entire human brain, or even a human, unless there's something major scientists and researchers are missing about how the laws of nature operate, there's no reason to think that uh, the artificial intelligent replicant won't have all the same properties as the original. Cyril's uh, argument is tied in with this hard problem of consciousness issue coined by David Chalmers, which has some uh, thinkers concluding that AI may never be conscious like a human is, despite how complex it is. In fact, Chalmers himself commented that CRA is fundamentally about consciousness. Now, as far as I know, Chalmers himself is undecided if AGI can ever be conscious, but in his paper facing up to the problem of consciousness, Chalmers believes a purely physicalist description of how consciousness works is incorrect. Now, to fully explain consciousness, we have to assign additional mental properties to reality to account for it that current physics has uh, never found and never predicted. Basically, there are easy problems of consciousness that explain things like the difference between wakefulness and sleep, the ability to focus attention, uh, integrate information, report mental states, and other similar cognitive skills, he thinks. Now, these differ from hard problems or subjective experiences like why we taste food the way we do or why we feel the warmth of sun against our skin. Now, why not process the feeling of warmth like a toaster, for instance, where there's no subjective experience of warmth at all? Chalmers believes we need to assign additional mental properties that science has never discovered yet to physical things to account for hard problem experiences, something called property dualism. Now, it's also led some to believe that there's something about consciousness purely biological and something artificial can never be awake like us. Now, to help illustrate this point, philosophers have proposed a tool called a philosophical zombie. Philosophical zombies are people just like us that behave and engage in the world like we do, but they don't have an inner subjective experience. When someone plays a sad song on the piano, we take that experience in, uh, in and we feel a mix of sad or some sort of emotions. The zombie would sit next to us taking in the same experience, but wouldn't register any emotions or any inner experience at all. Now, philosophical zombies are made of matter, cells, organs, just like us, but they lack that subjective element inside. They're dead inside, similar to how a sophisticated AI robot that's built uh, just like a human would be in theory. It would interact with us just like a regular human would, but inside there's no lights on, leading some thinkers to believe strong AI or any type of conscious AI can never exist in principle no matter how complex. You know, okay, but, there's a, but there's a number of criticisms regarding this idea. The philosopher Galen Strawson argues that it's impossible to establish the conceivability of philosophical zombies, so the argument can never get going. Now, philosophical zombie can exist in our imagination, 
but it's not physically possible without violating all the evidence regarding how the laws of nature currently work. Now, suppose researchers observe my brain under an MRI machine in a sophisticated AI brain that was a direct non-biological replica of me at the same time. We both listened to music. And then they saw our brains light up the same way. Now, they, that would mean that they would have to break the news to me that I'm a zombie or conclude that the zombie AI actually does have subjective experiences like me, which makes more sense given the current evidence of how the laws of nature work. Now, again, in the philosophy of mind, it's not possible right now to empirically verify if someone, including strong AI or some sort of sophisticated AGI, is conscious or not. But if knowledge exists as a spectrum of probability, it's far more likely that a sophisticated AI will be conscious. Physicists would have to rewrite much of how we understand nature, including the standard model of particle physics, to account for these extra mental properties Chalmers seems to hypothesize exist, and Cyril to some sort of extent too, although he's maintained he's not a property dualist. Okay, so at this point we have an understanding of what AI is, and it seems fairly clear, at least to me, that both weak AI and strong AI are artificially intelligent machines that can have consciousness are philosophically coherent concepts that will most likely impact all our lives at some point. Now, questions like what is AI? Can AI be alive? Uh, they've been debated for decades now, and they still are. But newer, possibly more urgent questions uh, are arising in the philosophy of AI, including ideas and questions around the singularity, transhumanism, the ethics of AI, AI alignment, philosophy generated by AI, and more. So let's briefly cover those. Okay, a new emerging part of the philosophy of AI that was initially brushed off, but it's being taken more seriously, is singularitarianism, or ideas around a theoretical technological singularity. Now, singularitarianism is defined by the belief that a technological singularity or a creation of a superintelligence will likely happen this century and create a point in which it's impossible to predict the future. Some think that deliberate action ought to be taken to ensure that the singularity benefits humans. The concept of the technological singularity was first proposed by the British cryptologist I.J. Good in 1965, writing, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever, since the design of machines is one of those intellectual activities. An ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. There would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine Machine is the last invention that man need ever make. Now, the term technological singularity was coined by a mathematician and author of Werner Vinge in the 1980s. The singularity is often associated with superintelligence, but can also refer to a point in human history where AGI is so powerful it's difficult to predict what will happen to humanity, similar to how it's impossible to see inside a black hole. Now, the theory is that AGI will be smart enough to improve itself rapidly in a short period without human intervention and give way to superintelligence very fast. What this superintelligence will do and how it will behave is beyond human comprehension. And we can see this outlined here where HI refers to human intelligence, AI plus is smart AGI, and S is the singularity. So first, you know, there will be AI created by HI such that AI is the same as HI. And premise two, if there is AI, there will be AI plus created by AI. Premise three, if there is AI plus, there will be AI plus plus created by AI plus. And then conclusion, there will be AI plus plus and the singularity will occur. So the futurist Raymond Kurzweil predicted uh, decades ago the singularity is going to occur in 2045. Artificial intelligence will reach human levels by 2029. If followed out, follow that out further, say 2045, and we will have multiplied the intelligence, the human biological machine intelligence, our civilization, a billionfold. He cites exponential growth in computing technology as, as suggested by Moore's law as why it will happen this century. Now, Moore's law states that the number of transistors on a microprocessor chip will double every two years or so, which has generally meant the chip's performance will too. Following what he calls the law of accelerating returns, technology and continued exponential growth, uh, the computing power of all computers will soon exceed that of human brains. And at that time, superhuman artificial intelligence will appear and could cause harm or even end humanity. Now, AI could be troublesome for humanity sooner rather than later because of knowledge-based super smart weapons and possible economic collapses due to lack of jobs for humans. But also it could spell disaster for humanity due to alignment problems with human-based goals and values. Now, some people may argue uh, or consider AI alignment not part of the philosophy of AI, but I think it is, as AGI could be built 
to carry out what we consider morally good or morally bad tasks, such as arresting or penalizing people, which dives into ethics. Now, AI alignment uh, research aims to steer AI machines toward their creator's interests and goals. When an AI is aligned, it means it advanced toward the initial intended objective or terminal goal. AI that's misaligned advanced toward a goal, but it's not the one designers intended. Now, simply put, AI alignment helps solve King Midas type issues. King Midas, sure as you know, was granted the wish that everything he touches turns to gold so he can become wealthy and happy in the end. Now, the problem was he ended up hugging his daughter and turned her into gold, which caused him great despair. And he didn't consider all the variables closely, so misalignment with his end goal happened. Now, a philosopher that's done a good job of bringing this problem uh, to the greater public, the idea of misalignment is Nick Bostrom, which he detailed in his best-selling book, Superintelligence, Path, Danger, Strategies. Bostrom gives the example of a superintelligence constructed to create paper clips more efficiently or calculate pi. In an attempt to calculate pi, the superintelligence may create and send nanobots to harvest all the world's resources for more computing power, and eventually the galaxy's resources. And this is all just to keep doing its calculations more efficiently, increasing finding more numbers in pi or refining its paper clips, thus destroying civilization by accident. He writes, to shape the future of Earth-originating life, the superintelligence could easily have non-anthropomorphic final goals and would likely have instrumental reasons to pursue open-ended resource acquisition. If we reflect that human beings consist of useful resources such as conveniently located atoms and that we depend on many more local resources, we can see that the outcome could easily be one in which humanity quickly becomes extinct. Now, there's been some criticisms of this which go along the lines of, you know, if AGI really becomes that sophisticated, it will learn an important moral value of humans, like killing is bad, and therefore it's not going to become misaligned like Bostrom's speaking about. But Bostrom has written about something called the thagonality thesis, which states intelligence and final goals are orthogonal axes along which possible agents can freely vary. In other words, more or less any level of intelligence could in principle be combined with more or less any final goal. Now think of it this way. You can have this type of scale where you can have uh, intelligent agents with complex uh, goals, weak simple agents with simple goals, complex intelligence with simple goals like making paper clips. Now if AGI is programmed to calculate pi or learn to make paper clips better, then no moral rules will stop it from achieving the program terminal goal of finding the end of pi. It may have no incentive to discover moral tasks. It may think that finding pi is the utmost moral task that comes ahead of other moral tasks. Now, I think AI alignment ties in with a newer emerging subpart of the philosophy of AI, which is the ethics of AI. So questions regarding the ethics of AI, of AI include if strong AI exists, is it automatically granted all the legal rights of an adult human? Are there morally good and morally bad AI systems? Should what society considers to be a morally bad AI be shut down and made illegal to code? How do we align AI with human ethical systems and which ethical systems do we pick for AI to follow or enforce? And this field is emerging because the general branch of ethics and philosophy is still being developed with many loose ends to it. Now today, there's no perfect ethical system in place for everyone to follow and not even an agreed definition of what morality is and how it's derived. The philosopher Leibniz believed humanity should work toward a type of logically sound moral system that functioned like math, where there was no controversies at all, and everything was fair and just. When controversies arise, there will be no need for a disputation between two philosophers than there would be between two accountants. It would be enough for them to pick up their pens and sit at their abacuses and say to each other, uh, perhaps uh, having summoned a mutual friend, let us calculate, something like that would make it a lot easier to build correctly aligned AGI, or at least you know, make it more straightforward. But right now, we don't have that. We only use combinations of consequentialist and deontological theories sort of stitched together, which suggests that it's almost guaranteed that we build ethically misaligned AGI. Now, cruel psychological punishments could happen to people due to powerful ethics-based AGI programs that were theoretically designed to help you know, make society flourish go wrong. What about ideas of morality, um, good and bad morally AI programs? Now, if it somehow demonstrated that something like, say, AI art programs increased human suffering more than they promoted, well, should they be made illegal to use or come with regulations? There's going to be all types of NAI and AGI about to be created, and some will have great benefits for the majority of humans. Others will increase suffering for the majority of people. Now, plus, an emerging branch of AI ethics is the ethics of transhumanism, you know, the idea that 
uh, technology, including AI, will merge with humans. Now, suppose there's a technology that allows certain people to connect their neocortex to the cloud and download knowledge to become way more intelligent than anyone else. Should a technology like that be made public to everyone and not just a few? Is it fair that someone could take a pill and through a combination of genetic engineering and AI make themselves look far more beautiful than the average person? Okay, so there's not much to go over at this point because the ethics of AI is an emerging field that's somewhat nebulous due to the, you know, the broader branch of ethics and philosophy having so many loose ends. Philosophers like Hume believe we might never have a fully just moral system as morality has to do with odd statements or how things should be, not about is statements or statements about how the world is. Morality is relative or constructed individually uh, if it even exists at all, you know, some think. Now, perhaps we could use AGI to tie up some of those loose ends and discover a Leibnizian-style, logically cohesive and perfectly just moral system uh, that would have taken humanity centuries to arrive at. But then we're experimenting with AI that could suggest and even make morally weighted decisions that could become misaligned and then cause severe harm. Okay, so there's uh, far more to that and to the philosophy of AI than what this short video covered, including far more nuance to all the arguments presented. Now, hopefully this served as an easy to understand 101 style introduction. And to learn more uh, and for further clarification, consult the scholarly resources in the video's description below. Now, this video was uh, really made to bring attention to the philosophy of AI. Many people are talking about AI right now and many current AI researchers, uh, executives, faces of the field believe the philosophy of AI is a useless, superfluous field of study that's just disrupting and slowing down AI engineering and development. You know, they think that we need to go as fast as possible to get this stuff out there. Now, hopefully, you've begun to understand why this type of thinking is not only incorrect, but dangerous. You know, it's fairly obvious AI is going to impact all our lives drastically sooner rather than later now. And hopefully this helped you understand a little more about what it is. Now, if this video helped you in any way, please consider liking it. This helps get uh, it found to people who may be looking for this type of information or need to find it. And feel free to subscribe for more videos like it. I'm going to be doing a lot more uh, AI videos coming up. So go ahead and use the link in the description to subscribe for those. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.